This is a bingo toilet seat. We don't know how many of these were made, but it's all with the uh, hooks and then different bingo lures in the toilet seat. I, I, I guess somebody had used this one at one time. I don't know, but I looked for 40 years to find one of these. We think there were probably, you know, maybe a dozen or two made, but uh, that's kind of the holy grail if you're a bingo collector is have a toilet seat. Retro bassin', kicking some ass in wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40 year old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Out on the bass boat, making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin. Welcome to Retro Bassin. By the way, if this is your first time here and you like to fish it old school, I'm talking about classic rods, reels, lures, and equipment from fishing days gone past, stick around, consider subscribing, and be sure to hit that bell icon. Otherwise, you won't know when we post a new video like this one. This week on Retro Bass, we are heading to the South Texas coast to meet up with a brand new bass and bud by the name of David, who probably has the premier collection of bingo baits in the entire world. David was kind enough to share his collection with me and <laughs> by extension, you guys. So hopefully you enjoy this little dive into Texas fishing lore history. In 1934, a fisherman by the name of Doug English began carving his own baits out of the handles of toothbrushes. Sometime after World War II, he developed a poured mold plastic bait, which would ultimately become known as the bingo. What I have here, by the way, is a paltry selection of my own bingo lures. And here is the standard bingo lure that I will show you. It's a pretty good representation of it. And what you can see that it is, it is a molded plastic uh, bait. It actually, the original bingo does not have any air pockets, rattles, anything in it. It's literally just a plastic bait. It's got an internal harness system here where you can see it's rigged up to two different treble hooks. And that is it. It was designed primarily to be fished under a popping cork for redfish and sea trout and Oof, son, uh, this was a mean, mean bait back in the day. Now, from a collector perspective, what is so cool about the bingo bait is because of its relatively simplistic design, it came in literally hundreds and hundreds of awesome old school colors. I've got a little selection here, but <laughs> just wait till we get down to our new Bass and Buds place and you'll see it is mind blowing the array of options they offered back in the day. So we're gonna head on down to the south coast of Texas. Please hop along the retro wagon and enjoy what I think is gonna be an amazing tour of an amazing collection. <laughs> enjoy. There were six companies that started in Corpus and several of them started in the 1930s selling, they were commercial rod and reelers, uh, not netters, but you know, with rod and reel, they carved their lures at night, and then they started selling them off bicycles down on the seawall here uh, as wood, and then we didn't have plastic until after World War II. And once plastic came out, they were able to make molds and pour, pour the baits out of uh, plastic that was available, and plastic just got better. There were five different sizes, each one made at one time in 58 colors. And you know, it's obviously they were catching the fishermen rather than the fish. Because for example, one would have a uh, orange back and a yellow belly, and then another one would have a yellow back and an orange belly. And would the fish know that? No, but the fishermen, oh, I gotta have that one. It's a little bit different. When the uh, uh, Mitchell 300 Avenue came out in about 1960, uh, people started using spinning gear down here. And some of the earliest fishermen, because we've got a naval base here, 
they were able to get the uh, 300 Mitchell out of France when the pilots would go over there. They would bring back the reels, and then probably five years later, they started importing them. But what was also neat down here about sight casting was they were able to get Polaroid glasses from the naval pilots out here. And all of a sudden, without that no glare, they could see what they were sight casting to. So much of this was used under a popping cork in the early days because very few people until about 1960 fish with, salt, with lures in salt water. Bass guys, you know, have always used it. So one of the things that was advertised on the paperwork you'd get with your lure was put it under a popping cork and, you know, just make noise up top and there come the, the fish. Plugging shorty shrimp, all of these are all three sizes and one color. Doug English was the owner of Bingo. He convinced Plugging Shorty to take his wooden baits that he was using as a commercial rod and reeler and make them out of plastic. Plugging Shorty said, I don't want to do that because that would, if these were on the market, people would be catching more fish and that would drive the price of fish down for me and I'm getting three cents a pound for fish. So after Doug English told him, hey dude, you can make a lot more money selling these lures than you can fishing, they started producing his wooden lures now in plastic. So everything plug and shorty's got a wing on it where you regulate the water depth by how fast you reel. And they've got different uh, three line ties on them. So you can regulate your depth by where you attach your line. They were sold from 1948 to about 1951. It was a very short period of time. Doug English, they had a falling out, Plugging Shorty and his family, Plugging Shorty being Anton Stetner, uh, said, I'm done, I'm toast. He got nothing out of the deal with Doug English, the owner of Bingo. And he and his wife started making the triple chance spoon here in Corpus in their kitchen. And you can still buy a triple chance spoon, but the, the Shorty family never got a red sand out of any of the uh, plug and shorty shrimp. This is hand rigged on a plumber's chain. This this is probably 1920s and it's just beautiful. It's hand painted and has the plumber's chain, a weight in it, and it actually has a, a swimming action to it. Very so that's that's a fun one. Hedden made some really beautiful uh, spooky shrimp. These are really very beautiful. Some of these are Florida companies like a, a Ben Smith lures and these are Corpus lures for the most part. Sportsman, Nichols, Fred Farmer. The body is hollow and the sides are ported, drilled. So it's meant to put a piece of peel shrimp inside of and you screw the head back on and uh, there's an application for that today with fish bites being on the market but it's a hard bait that was long before any soft plastics were available but the Manning's Tasty Shrimp and that's a complete set up there a complete set of eight it's got legs and it's got the you know early monofilament uh, we didn't have monofilament really till the late 50s. These are plugs that I used as a kid. I just literally, when I could, lived on the piers and jetties. Just, you know, sleeping bag and eating spam and Viennas and saltine crackers. And uh, a lot of these lures I threw as a kid. A lot of them are real toothy from kingfish and tarpon. And I was a real hardcore angler. I was in my 20s, I mean. But, but I got interested in it because I had some of the lures and got to do some research to find out these guys are still alive. So I would go over and see him. The shop manager got to know him. Interesting story. He, was, uh, he ran the shop, ran the bingo shop when Doug English, the owner, was on the road selling. And they sold, Hump and Bingo sold lures, had five salesmen on the road. This is 1950s and 60s all Gulf states and all the way up to the Carolinas selling their lures, Hump and Bingo. So those two companies really had a lot to do with, okay, it's not just bass fishermen that use artificials, it's saltwater people. But I, I got to know uh, 
uh, Jack McElroy, the shop manager, and went over to see him one night. That was in the 70s, and he said, you know, I've got all this, these lures, I've got no children, I've got no grandchildren, do you want this stuff? And I came home that night with about 3,000 plugs, 2,500. And so many of them were one of a kind. He said, I ran the show. He told me, I said, I made 12 for this guy and I kept one. So uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of how I got started was getting to know some of these old guys that now would be, you know, they're smoldering in the grave now. But, you know, then they were still alive and I just got lucky. I got started early because trying to put together the kind of stuff I've got now, you just, you can't do it. If you take the uh, Old English, which was pre-Bingo, you take that catalog sheet, which I've got, it'll show maybe 10 colors. I've got 115 in there. Those were, that's why, you know, every time he'd make one that was different, he would hang on to it. The floater sinkers, uh, some of the first floating uh, topwater baits, there were 19 colors made. I've got over 100 of those. And had some with weight, some with no weights. So those are the, they, the first ones they produced were called the twists. And that was the, the peppermint twist was kind of that line. And then later on they said, man, these things are selling like hotcakes. And they started making, you know, frog and, black, and, and the shores, black shore, white shore. But when they started making these, there was not really very much reflective material you could put inside one. So they used bubble gum wrappers chewing gum wrappers as a, a foil and then later on the foils became more sophisticated where they had a little pattern on them and so forth but uh, kind of a, an evolution from the probably the 1940s all the way through the company closed actually in about 1969 so they're you know these this is all from the 40s to the end of the 60s this is a picture of two fishermen. This is World, World War I veterans. Both of them lost a leg in World War I, and they fished here in Corpus, and that day they posed for him, who was a chiropractor photographer, with their catch that day, and that just almost makes me tear up to see that. Coastal Lure Company was bought in Corpus by Mr. Humphreys, moved to El Campo, and then, then it became Hump Lure Company. And you know their motto was uh, "Don't get bumps, fish with humps," and uh, fish by numbers. Every every hump had a number on it, from zero to twenty-eight. So anytime you read any of the old newspaper articles that were written back in the fifties and sixties, it would say, "And these fish were caught on a hump M5 or a hump or a hump A13 uh, or something something like that." So. They're very innovative, and again, they had salesmen like Bingo did on the road with lures all the way up to the Carolinas selling saltwater lures. It looks like a Bingo, but it's it's different. It did, It's only got, uh, you know, in most cases, one line tie on it on the on the back, where Bingo had two or three depending on the lure. You go into the at the t manufacturing shop, which was just probably something about like this. You had people lined up on a table putting lures together and so forth. You know, Friday nights, the uh, uh, the fishermen, the friends, they would go to the shop and drink beer and they would make lures at night. Just kind of a, well, I want to do this, that. But one of the cool things, when I interviewed Mr. Humphreys, he was a, the worst case of Alzheimer's I've ever seen and I've seen a number of cases they had him in a wheelchair he didn't know anything about anything but his therapy that the nurses would do would give him some of his blank lures and he would paint them like a two-year-old child and just totally out of it but that he was so in love with the company that he had I would get people call me up and say hey I read your article I've got this old tackle box you want it you know that kind of stuff one day on a Sunday I had a very drunk obnoxious person call me up and say I read your article you ain't got you need to come see me so he pissed me off number one his attitude but at the same time I gotta go see this guy so I went over there, he lived in a cotton field. Uh, he was a, a bandito, 
that had run a flea market in Kingsville for 30 years. He was dying of cancer. So I went over there. I came back with uh, 62 wooden rods, about 150 reels, all kinds of stuff. Right when I was getting ready to leave, he said, if you'll buy me a six pack and I prefer warm beer, uh, I'll take you over to a beer joint on Baffin Bay and I've got some lures over there you might want to buy. So we went over there. I couldn't get him hot beer <laughs> or warm beer. It had to be, you know, he, he wasn't very happy about that. Walked into this beer joint called the Green Frog and on the wall were two cases. There was a saltwater case and a freshwater case. And the lid on this one was out about like that because people, every, the beer drinkers, every time the fishermen had come in, they would hang lures on their spoons and mirror lures and all kinds of stuff. I didn't even know this was behind it until I got it home and started taking these lures off the side. I mean, it was that thick with lures. And this was behind it. And what they said, there was a commercial rod and reeler over there on Baffin back in the late 50s, early 60s that put this case together and hung it in there. He had bought the lures that were in there and just left them there. He owned them and I bought them from him. I had a, lure, a friend that's a knife collector, real high-end life. He, he doesn't know anything about lures, but he said, I know those lures are worth something, but I'll bet you that case is worth more than the lures. He said, that's a Winchester knife case. That used to be in a hardware store or something like that. I didn't buy the other case because it was fresh water, but it was the same way. The lid was out, and I thought, uh, you know, what am I going to do with fresh water? You know? So I kicked myself to this day for not getting those because I don't know what was behind that, you know, all that junk that was hanging on the front. This is a bingo toilet seat. We don't know how many of these were made, but it's all with the uh, hooks and then different bingo lures in the toilet seat. I, I, I guess somebody had used this one at one time, I don't know, but I looked for 40 years to find one of these. We think there were probably, you know, maybe a dozen or two made, but uh, that's kind of the holy grail if you're a bingo collector is have a toilet seat. When Plucky Shardy died, they, he's buried here in, in cemetery in Rose Hill. Uh, they embedded his lures in the headstone and then over the years, people pried them all out. But Have you ever seen a toilet seat with bass lures in there? No. This is unbelievable. Oh, it's heavy. Heavy, oh yeah, it's, uh, it's serious. And Doug uh, made a few of these for his friends and I guess a few probably for some of his uh, suppliers, I don't know. From about 1948, to 1969 was the run of Old English Bingo Plug and Shorty. And uh, then the co uh, Houston Company bought out Bingo and they produced Bingo, I guess into the early 80s, the Zappalak family out of Houston. But uh, you, you can tell immediately with the Houston Bingos versus the Corpus Bingos, the colors were wilder. Uh, they just didn't have that old school appeal. You know, they weren't sexy. Doug English actually had people, he had canvas shirts made for his field testers who were friends and good fishermen. Doug always said you, he could tell a fisherman if he was good good or not just by the way he walked, if the guy knew what he was doing. Yeah. But anyway, he would give uh, these hats out and to people that would test his lures. And uh, so I've got a lot of the old vintage stuff. This was actually my uncle's wading hat. This was one of the most fish catching color patterns in saltwater history. It was old red with the small yellow dots. And uh, this is Corpus Christi Company's uh, Pico, Glimmo Minnows, uh, Hoagies out of uh, El Campo, all of the uh, humps. I had to stick that goofy sail shark in there, but uh, everybody kind of like they jumped on hot pink. This was, I mean, most wade fishermen in Texas for red and trout back in the day, that would be the go-to color was red with the yellow dots. You know, for 25 years, I didn't know anybody after I put all this together that collected lures. I mean, it was like, I'm the only guy. And it just, I, went, I was 
stagnant for probably 25 years until I found out there's some groups out there that actually collect what I collect. And I plugged in and started buying some cases and pulling all this stuff out of cigar boxes and where I had it stored and cardboard boxes and, uh, you know, the rest is, is history. People tend to specialize in a certain model or a certain color or whatever and try to amass those. But because I was so lucky when I started, I've just got, you know, I don't think anybody comes close to what I've got in the diversity. But yet, at the same time, it all focuses on six companies that started in Corpus. The plugging shorty, Anton Stetner, his, I got to know his daughter, who was a graphic artist in California. I don't think she's alive now. And she sent this to me. And this is all on her father, plugging shorty. She said, when I was 15 years old, I painted this on my daddy's boat. That's when he was still a commercial rod and reeler. And he, he, she said, Daddy, if Daddy couldn't go out and catch 100 pounds of trout and redfish in a day, he always said he ought to be doing something else. He came here in 1929 as a fuller brush salesman from South Dakota, North Dakota or South Dakota, I can't remember. And he came down here, he was a big time fisherman up there in the lakes of the Dakotas. Came down here on a sales trip and never went back. Brought his family down here and he started commercial rod and reeling. Story about Bingo, uh, English uh, said that uh, every time he would uh, catch, uh, find a group, he said, I probably gave away more lures than I ever sold. But he said, when I gave a lure away, I would say, I'm giving you this lure, but every time you catch a fish on it, you must yell bingo. <laughs> and the word was, soon, everywhere you went in Texas, people were yelling bingo, bingo. And then, as over time, I found, as I said, all this lure collecting I'd done started coming to the surface again because I found that other people did it. And I, I didn't know I was sitting on so much history. But I, I, I knew from the beginning I, I'm going to amass this because there's so much history here that needs to be preserved. And I think that's what we were talking about. You know, it's got to be put somewhere where the people can see what these six companies in Corpus did for saltwater fishing. Because before that, you used mullet, you used shrimp, you used squid, and then all of a sudden these companies came out and said, hey, you can catch... Maybe not as many fish, but bigger fish if you use artificials. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed our brief tour of that amazing collection of classic Texas saltwater lures. Thanks again, David, for welcoming me into your uh, museum and also sharing your great collection with all the Bass and Buds out there. And until next time, Bass and Buds, keep on plugging and definitely fish it old school. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bastards.